Download the free PhysioTutors app now and become the best clinician you can be. Welcome along, everyone, to, to the, this lecture that's going to be about the role of the cervical spine in dizziness. So we know that the neck is an important organ, so it has um, lots of musculoskeletal structures. It's also a sensory organ so that it actually can refer pain into the head and pain in the head can actually refer to the neck. But there's also vascular structures uh, which run through that cervical region, which potentially could cause dizziness. There's also a close association between the autonomic nervous system and structures like the sympathetic um, uh, and the upper cervical spine and structures like the sympathetic ganglion and some of the cranial nerves as well. And we also, so that can also cause dizziness. And then we know that uh, it's involved with sensory motor control. So sensory motor control basically is where you have input from the vestibular system, the visual system, and the proprioceptive system. But I would argue that the neck is really important here, and this provides input into the um, to the brain, and that provides motor output for eye movement control, uh, head movement control, as well as postural stability. So when we're thinking about cervicogenic dizziness or the role of the neck in dizziness, then we need to get the terminology right because clearly there are different types and presentations of cervical-related dizziness. So for example, in the vascular, the cervical might trigger something like um, vertebrobasilar insufficiency, which technically is a central disorder, but it's triggered by um, movements and positions of the neck affecting the uh, vertebral artery. Then we also have autonomic nervous system, which could again be triggered by the cervical spine due to those close associations, particularly in that upper cervical region. And then we have proprioceptive dizziness, which is related to a cervical musculoskeletal condition. So, so there are different types, they'll present differently. And so we need to make sure that we're talking about the same thing when we're talking about the role of dizziness in the neck. So I'm going to be focusing on proprioceptive dizziness and how does how does the neck cause proprioceptive dizziness? So we know that there's a high percentage of muscle spindles, particularly in these suboccipital muscles. So for example, the inferior oblique muscle has around about 240 muscle spindles per gram of muscle. So that's really high proportion. If you compare that to the thumb, which you would think is a fairly sensory organ, there's only 16 grams uh, per 16 muscle spindles per gram. So certainly high numbers of uh, muscle spindles and proprioceptors providing input into that sensory motor control system. We also know that there are reflex connections between the, uh, the visual system and the vestibular system and the neck. So we have reflexes like the tonic neck reflex, which helps to maintain postural stability. The cervical ocular reflex, which works with the vestibular ocular reflex, to keep our gaze stable while our head's moving, and then the cervicocolic or and vestibulocolic reflex, which works to help keep our head stable while we're moving the trunk. So all of these have connections between the visual and vestibular systems, so that's important. There's also very unique central nervous system connect connections between cervical afferent in input as well, directly to the vestibular nuclei, as well as the superior colliculus, which is thought to be the center for eye and head coordination. We know that if we try and disturb afferents, then we can actually cause changes in sensory motor control. So then we know from that, then the cervical afferents are important for sensory matching, knowledge of the head in relation to the body and coordination, helping to control postural stability and balance, and also helping with ocular motor control. And when you think about it, this has good relevance for function where the majority of the time our, we need our neck to get our eyes and our ears where they need to be. We're not doing strong, um, you know, heavy lifting with our neck, but the main function is to have this dynamic control so that we can see and hear properly. So the impact of altered sensory motor control then and in, in, on sensory motor control um, it, this is a busy sort of slide, but sort of showing you that at this initial level, where if we have direct damage or functional impairment or changes in the muscles that might impact muscle spindle sensitivity, and that could be due to pain, inflammation, 
um, trauma, even stress can activate the sympathetic nervous system and then that can also impair cervical afferent input. So who has this? So we know there is evidence of this in both traumatic and idiopathic origin, but it definitely is more in association with trauma and disease. So for example, whiplash, um, in concussion, we know that people often have a cervical component because of the um, direct trauma to the head causing trauma to the neck. And then we also know that people with cervical degenerative disc disease often complain of dizziness and have deficits in balance, etc. But we do know that it's more in the upper cervical um, region and that makes sense because that's where most of the, um, the sens sensory information is coming from. And we also know that this occurs across the ages. So it's not just in young people, it's in old people as well. And in older people, this has implications for falls because you've got those people have a declining visual and vestibular system already. So uh, it's really important in our elderly that we are making sure that the neck is working um, effectively. We also know that the neck, neck treatment can relieve dizziness if it's cervical. So in patients who'd ha who had um, cervical disc disease and dizziness after surgery, this resolved. When did this start? What caused the initial dizziness? What caused the initial neck problem? So that we can try and work out if there's been any trauma that could potentially be causing um, other causes of dizziness at the same time. We also want to um, be looking for descriptors that might indicate it might, might be more cervicogenic, which is things like vague unsteadiness, lightheadedness. Um, the things that should make the dizziness at worse uh, or, and um, aggravated would be things like putting the neck into um, sustained positions, awkward movements or different movements. The associated symptoms are usually things like just visual disturbances but not true neurological signs. And we can use self-reported questionnaires like the dizziness handicap inventory to help us to uh, quantify the amount of dizziness that they have. The things that aren't associated with cervicogenic dizziness routinely are things like true vertigo, so true spinning where the world's spinning, true hearing loss. So they might report a subjective sort of feeling of fullness in the ear, but when they have the ears tested, there's no change. And they shouldn't have any true neurological signs or things like double vision. So they might have blurred vision, but certainly not double vision. And it won't be aggravated by things like loud noises, general moving around, um, stress, coughing, for example. So those sorts of things typically will um, aggravate other causes of dizziness and certainly wouldn't be something you would um, expect with the neck. Then we're going to be looking at our physical examination and we're going to be looking at our, what impairments they have across um, different systems to try and look for that pattern of um, altered, um, of musculoskeletal dysfunction. So we'll be looking at the articular, neural, neuromuscular system and sensory motor system as well in association with alignment and movement which can be affected by those systems. So as I said that before the role of the neck can be challenging because just because you have neck pain doesn't mean that it's coming from the neck and we need to be mindful of how well one physical sign can help diagnose dizziness. So if we think about tenderness or trigger points, these really lack specificity. They're present in things like migraine, tension type headache in people that don't have a cervical musculoskeletal disorder. Range of motion by itself can be quite variable between normal subjects. There's also age-related effects and it's not always seen in patients with neck pain. They might have full range of motion, but they may have pain at the, the limits of that. That means that there's potential for people who do have cervicogenic dizziness as one form of dizziness who would get excluded because they have another form of dizziness. So that um, potentially affects, you know, the cost and people taking medication and then time that people get diagnosed for, for things if we're having to use these criteria. What we do know is that people who have neck pain and dizziness have a poorer quality of life than those who only report dizziness. So it is important that we're able to determine what is happening in these patients who've got, got both neck pain and dizziness. 
problem is, as I mentioned, the presence of not neck pain is not simple. So just because you have neck pain does not necessarily mean you've got a cervical musculoskeletal disorder. So it, it's potentially that it is, but we also know that people with primary headache, like tension type headache and migraine headache, about 70 to 80% of those patients will report neck pain. That's not necessarily coming from the neck. Uh, so what are we going to do as far as the interpretation of the role of the cervical spines? So did they have problems more when they're walking with large head range rather than fast, small movements? Remember, we're not going to be focusing on just muscle tension or trigger points. So after that, we need to put it all together and we need to think, do the signs and symptoms explain the degree and the presentation of the dizziness? So then this is going to affect some management decisions and it's important that we get this right because appropriate interventions will, um, will the treatments will differ depending on what the role of the neck is. It's going to be cost effective um, and it's, then we're able to, you know, uh, be able to apply the right treatment to the right people. So management decisions then, if there's absolutely no role, there's no cervical musculoskeletal condition, um, then no cervical treatment is indicated. If we feel there's no role, but there is a comorbid cervical musculoskeletal condition, then we might treat, decide to treat cervical, the cervical musculoskeletal system to help assist other treatments for dizziness. So for example, if somebody has uh, a vestibular peripheral vestibular problem, they're not able to do their vestibular rehab well because uh, they've got a neck condition and they can't move their neck well, then this might help to facilitate that. So that's where we would be treating the neck, knowing that we're not treating the dizziness, but we're going to help help them so that they can treat that system more effectively. Uh, it might be that the cervical musculoskeletal condition has been aggravated by another cause of dizziness. So here the head's held still and we're just torsioning the neck. So we're changing afferent input from the neck. We're not changing anything in the vestibular system. And we're repeating that and we're looking to see if we're getting any change in that ability to follow nice and closely. So we do that to the left and to the right. And we're looking for quick catch-up saccades. So if people can't keep up with the moving target, their eyes have to quickly move to try and keep up with it. So that's in a normal person. We sit, we're getting that what's happening in neutral, what's happening with the eye follow. Then we put them into that torsion position and we're looking to see if this gets worse in the torsion position compared to the neutral position. So if it's not very good in neutral, but it's the same amount in torsion, then that's not a positive test. What we're looking for is that it changes or gets worse in the torsion position. And that might be both sides or it may be just one side, left, left or right. So this is an example of a person with whiplash who has a positive smooth pursuit neck torsion test. So you can see in neutral that the patient's able to um, follow along fairly nicely, left and right, as the target's moving across. And then when we put them into the torsion position, you can see that it's um, not too bad coming across to the left, but as soon as they come across to the right, they get this quick catch-up saccades at, at the end there. So they're following okay, and then they get that quick catch-up saccade. So that's certainly different to what we saw in the neutral position. So this would indicate that the smooth pursuit uh, neck torsion test is positive in this patient. And that would indicate that the neck is influencing eye movement control. This is someone with whiplash. And you can see that they are, they're much more jerky, much slower. And they're coming outside of that grey zone a lot more more. So coming right outside it, outside it, outside it. So you can use this test and you can count the number of times they come outside of, of the grey zone. And so more than 10 times coming outside of that grey zone is abnormal. And if they take more than about 25 seconds to do the test, that's also abnormal. 
So the instruction is more that you want them to trace along the bold line as accurately as they can, and that the test is more about accuracy than speed. But certainly, um, if people are taking a, a ridiculously a long time, that means that, they, that they're impaired and they're trying to have that trade-off of um, speed with accuracy. We can also look at eye head coordination. Is the dizziness driving the neck pain or is the neck pain driving the dizziness, for example? So then this is going to affect some management decisions and it's important that we get this right because appropriate interventions will, um, will the treatments will differ depending on what the role of the neck is. Did they have a positive smooth pursuit neck torsion? Did they have trunk, impaired trunk head coordination? If we felt that there were probably other things that it sounded like or as we were going through the testing it was looking more like it might be vestibular then we can add specific other vestibular tests. Um, if we thought it was BPPV, we would be looking at um, doing a whole pike sticks um, to see if that reproduced um, symptoms. Um, we could also do those tests to compare or change inputs. So where we looked at, um, for example, that sustained torsion versus sustained on block or um, head neck differentiation in the sustained, uh, sorry, in the torsion position compared to the on block position. And then we might need to do special tests for red flags um, like BBI, for example, or craniosphacal instability if we felt that that was necessary. Remember, we're not going to be focusing on just muscle tension or trigger points. Um, we're going to be mindful of anybody who's got neck pain or motion sensitivity just with testing, but nothing else. And certainly isolated findings. So if somebody's just got a reduced range of motion, but they don't have any joint signs and their muscle function is good, then we're not thinking that that's a true cervical musculoskeletal disorder. So after that, we need to put it all together and we need to think, do the signs and symptoms explain the degree and the presentation of the dizziness? So if they've got a very mild cervical musculoskeletal disorder, but they're reporting constant, um, you know, or daily um, dizziness, then perhaps that's that's not adding up correctly. Um, and then that might help us to look at the relationship and the drivers. So what's driving the neck pain? So certainly it's good to be treating the neck when it's needed, but certainly we don't want to be treating the neck when it's not needed. And this is going to have um, implications for the benefits to the patient. And then also adding in these tailored sensory motor control exercises, um, depending on what impairments we found in the patient. For phase two, then we would be working on progressing that to strengthening endurance. Um, once neuro and sensory motor behaviours have been addressed, we graded, we do a graded increase in that and, and we may need to, you know, be doing repetitions um, and, you know, keeping that strengthening program for at least eight weeks. And then um, thinking about the, both neck and scapular muscles, if scapula is, has been shown to be a, um, part of the problem. So here's a case study. So we have Mr. Wise, 30 years old. He's a full-time accountant. He had a concussion after a fall at work and he hit his head on a basin. So his main problem now is intermittent dizziness. He, when he's looking down, when he's doing shoulder checks, when he's driving, and he feels a little bit unsteady at times. He's got daily neck stiffness and pain on the right more than the left. 